Alas, by the 1960s, the once proud time had degenerated into a notorious porno cinema and a popular haunt for some very dubious characters. One day in 1974, the projector blew a fuse for the last time. And this was the fate of so many of our great theatres. Stan Laurel's father built this one, and young Stan did his very first turn here. Next week, it'll be a car park. The best future a derelict theatre could expect was as a bingo hall. Well, it looked as if the time was heading for exactly the same fate. But then in 1977, along came a bloke called Jack Dixon, and the whole thing changed. Jack, now you look a fairly normal, intelligent chap. What on earth persuaded you to get involved with something like this? Well, uh, I wanted the lead and fiddler on the roof. And I had to... <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> That's exactly the truth, really. I mean, we'd, we'd been amateurs and doing shows in different places all over the, um, in, in Newcastle. And um, everyone brags, you know, if you're an amateur, you think that you've, you've got to have your own premises. And um, What did you see, Jack, stuff. when you first came in? What did you actually see on that stage? And... Well, the, on the stage, I mean, the, the cinema screen was there and um, we had to get that down because it was a steel structure. But behind the, the cinema screen, to stop the drafts, they had the scenery from a maid from the east standing there. Now, we didn't know it at the time. We just thought, what the heck's all this stuff? Which was the 1919 show? The, the last 1919 show. And that was still on the stage. And the drop cloth was there with a sailing boat and, oh, and the eerie, whole lot. Yeah. Eerie. We've still got the stuff. Yeah. Actually, but, um, and that was the sort of excitement. I mean, you're not a fool at the time, but you don't know what you're getting into. You know more about the theatre than I do. And maybe you would be slightly frightened to try it. You're right. Whereas you're I right. don't know anything, so I'm not frightened. There's a lot of good, enthusiastic members who scrubbed and cleaned and didn't know what they were doing it for. They just had a love for something. If only they'd have realised, Jack, it was to give you the lead in Fiddler on the Roof. I, I, I was good in it as well. <laughs> For me, the most exciting part of the time theatre, not only backstage, but underneath the stage, here in the bowels of the earth. Actually, how far are we underneath stage level here, Jack? About 25 feet from the actual stage, but you've got a mezzanine level a little bit higher than this, and that's where all the operation's done. Yeah. To operate the gear wheels that you see here. Now, Jack, we can see the gear wheels here now, but when, I mean, this was another case of time suspended, wasn't it, when you came down here for the Well, I mean, we arrived at the Time Theatre in 1977, and the, the whole of the place was filled with rubbish, carpenters, old playbills, yeah. wood shavings, and, and one thing that we found later on was a human arm bone about, you know, this arm bone, I don't know the technical term for it, and we'd had a young group of volunteers clearing the place out. And of course, when we found the human arm bone, we had to get the police in. Yeah. So the police came down here, and a big gang, with shovels, wellingtons on, and they cleared the whole of this place out for us, <laughs> looking for more human bones, you see. You didn't so, put the arm in, in the first no, place? No, we didn't. We didn't do that. But we found the human bone, and they found it was 150 year old. It was older than the, the theatre itself. And um, these young kids who were all volunteers, and a broad Geordie voice said, I don't know what all the bloody problem is about this. He says, we found stacks of them, we threw them on the skip. <laughs> and, but what it was is, you know, all the, all the machinery, there's the, there's the grave trap there, which is commonly called the, the Hamlet trap. Yes. And when they did Hamlet in the olden days, they actually used human bones that they would get from the hospital. Right. Now, they did do huge stage effects here, didn't they? Jack, in the old days, some of the productions, they did things like, I mean, they, they raced the Grand, you know, the Derby and stuff like that. On the stuff, Grand National, they? yes. Yeah. They had the Grand National, um, the winner of the Grand National, Actually appeared, really? yes, and on on stage, and it didn't was, have a leg missing. That wasn't the bone you found there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a human bone that one. But um, 
the, the, the Grand National, the sinking of the Armada with fire ships coming on from different directions and uh, the stage would be moving and there'd be hundreds of people. It was very labor intensive. And here's some rare film of the original star of Me and My Girl, Lupino Lane, showing us the kind of magic you could create with the simplest of stage machinery. Magic right enough. In eight years, Jack Dixon and his company produced a staggering 70 shows and refurbished the theatre. But everything really turned to gold when Placido Domingo arrived to seal the time status as a venue for opera. Then came that fateful day in 1985. The fire had been well away for hours before anyone spotted the smoke and flames. Most people were at home putting their turkeys on. It was of all days, Christmas Day. It's now a bitterly cold day in January, and the recent gales have just brought tons of bricks down onto what was left of backstage. Under the Tyne stage was one of the few intact examples of Victorian machinery left in Europe, complete with springs, lifts, revolves and traps. The editor consultant Dave Wilmore had spent years restoring it. Well, at the moment we're actually dismantling, getting all the bits up into a warehouse to start putting the jigsaw puzzle together. Obviously a lot of the timber was burnt and that'll have to be replaced, but we're now in the process of going through salvaging all the metalwork from the debris that you see about us now. Henry Irving, Ellen Terry, Sarah Bernhardt, George Roby, they all came here. And later, theatre buffs from all over Europe came to marvel at the auditorium. Now it's soaked in gallons of water. That was an end of the, that was a disingenuous catch, by the way. Thankfully, the backstage inferno was held away from the auditorium, apart from a few holes where it broke through the plasterwork. The real damage here is not as bad as they feared, thanks to the safety curtain and the young lad who lowered it after the last performance. He followed an age-old theatre rule and saved the theatre from being a total write-off. It's going to cost at least a million and a half quid to restore the time to its former glory. But the good news is that the insurance people are coming up with the cash. Over at the workshop, reconstruction of the stage machinery is underway, using photographs, drawings and remains. Everything is to be exactly as it was in 1867. And nothing has been thrown away that can't be straightened out and used again. There's not much left of the front cloths, but their original designs are going to be an essential guide for the new set. 